Beloved and friends, the church exists to make much not of the church, but of Christ. The church exists to make much of Christ and nothing else. And this is a stewardship. And so we are considering the church as a steward. I want, you, I want us to begin by thinking about just the preciousness of the church. Don't go tired of hearing what Christ has done for us as a people. I pray that we would all be re rejuvenated in the thought of the uniqueness of the glory of God in the church of Christ. The church has no meaning apart from Christ. We are not a social gathering merely. Has no meaning apart from Christ. Her existence is one that is from God and is through God and is to God. She exists. She has her being. She lives and moves. And all that she does is truly to make much of Christ. She is a steward of his manifold graces. And she is taken into her own heart. And she holds in her hands the only cure to the plight of humanity. She is the only one in all the world who has the gospel. And because of this, she is uniquely precious to Christ set apart from every other institution. She is the only one on earth who is appointed, who is gifted, and who is able to proclaim Christ in the power of his spirit for the salvation of humanity. The church is the most undervalued reality that's tangible in this world. Let me say that again. The church is the most undervalued reality that is tangible in this world. We just don't see it. Christ loves the church with an unprecedented and immeasurable love far above all other things he has ever set his heart upon. Christ loves the church and should that not be enough for us to love her and treat her as his peculiar, precious bride. She is a chosen race. She is a holy priesthood, or sorry, a royal priesthood and a holy nation and a people for his own possession. And for this end, a stewardship that she, she may proclaim the excellencies of him who has saved us out of darkness and placed us into his marvelous light. So from her identity, we see her role and responsibility in the world, and we understand how she, the church, relates to every other institution. From this, I want us to think that and understand that the church is highly graced. You are highly graced by God. And as such are highly responsible as stewards of grace. And we looked last week as stewards of grace to the world. We're the only ones who have the gospel for the world. And today, stewards of grace to families. To families. This is a very practical message, one that is very much personally shepherding, one that I pray would be well received and received in love. It's a message that helps us to understand why we do what we do as a church. We always need to come back to why, why, why. Why do we do what we do as a church? For instance, let me just be very upfront and practical. Why does Trinity Bible Church not have a traditional youth group? Well, that's a question that I pray today will answer. Let me start it this way. What parent treasures Christ and does not earnestly seek the same for their precious children? What church makes much of Christ and does not sincerely long to see every single child come to know and make him known? 
Our highest aim should be to honor and glorify God by promoting Christ in His church and in our homes. Our ambition should be set with passion for the gospel to penetrate and Christ to be formed in every single child. This is something that is shared between the church and the family. So the real question is not if that should be our passion, if a church should be passionate to see Christ in the children, to love them and see their souls be forever saved and reconciled to their maker. This is, it's not a question of if, it's a question of how then should the family and the church work together? These are longings that are shared by every Christ-centered family and Christ-centered church. So here's my answer. And I pray that the message will help show this to be something that is not picked out of the air, but something that is truly the derivative and result of biblical truth. And that is that the church is a steward of grace to families. A biblically informed answer as to how the two work together requires a healthy understanding of their respective roles and responsibilities, namely between the family and the church. So I want to walk you through these four basic principles to help us get that perspective, to understand their distinctives and understand how then, how then can we glorify God together as church and as families So number one principle is going to be, first, the plan for families. I want us to think about this. This is big picture, and it's super exciting. I pray that you would engage and give your heart's thoughts. And children, raise your hand if you're a child. If you're 12 years old or younger, raise your hand. Anyone listening 12 years and under? 12 years and under. Good. All right. I see 12 and under. All right, that's like bar mitzvah age. That means son of the law age. That, that's good. All right, so this, I want you to listen because this is part directly to you. Big picture, and for everyone here, even, even singles and widows, everyone here, let us come together and think big picture. What is God's plan for families? What is his plan for for families. The family was the very first institution that God ever created. It is indeed the cornerstone of all human society. It is the first institution. And the cornerstone of the family is the marriage, husband and wife, the most precious union on earth. This is the very first thing that God did among humanity. In fact, he drew attention to this out of his way by closing act one in Genesis one, closing the whole scene from nothing to everything and saying it's all very good. And then giving us chapter two, which is a second scene that's very different. He, He rewinds the clock and he brings us into one little square of ground. He zooms the camera into one little segment in the garden and he wants us to notice that there's, he's going to make a man. And then he wants us to notice that the man is alone. And in his entire good creation, he says one profound thing before sin in a good creation, he says one thing is not good. Now, you got to understand the theological weight of that. God is declaring something not good. There's no sin and everything is good. And yet he declared something not good. And what is it? Genesis 2, 18. It is not good that man should be alone. So I will make for him an etzer konegdo, a suitable helper, like a glove and a hand, a counterpoint corresponding to every contour of his being. Very uniquely special. And so he forms the woman, from the man, and he brings her to him. And they unite in this tremendous and dramatic ceremony of sorts of a father bringing a bride and the husband declaring, you are 
Bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. You are like me. I am like you. We, we are together. The two shall become one to never separate again. And the family was born. Marriage is the cornerstone of the family, and the family is the cornerstone of society. The family is designed to show forth a, a kind of dignity and glory, a, a love and a joy that properly belongs to the image of God. It is something that uniquely shows forth marriage and family, uniquely reflect the Holy Trinity, a community of love and relationship, a present picture A parable of the profound, as Paul would say. This mystery is profound because I say that marriage between a husband and a wife refers to, points to, is a shadow that shows the substance, points to the substance of Christ and the church. God is not ashamed to use the marriage and family as a picture for us as to his relationship to us and his love for us. These are profound things. Let us recognize that the family has a significant purpose in the grand plan of God. Amen? Amen. It was designed, it was created, it was blessed, and it was commissioned before sin and before the fall. And its ultimate purpose points to consummate glory of everlasting life with God as Father and His people as our brothers and our sisters. This is the ultimate purpose and plan of family. This design, this design of God for the family is true of God's purposes for every single family on earth. Follow what I'm saying. But a singular catastrophe has broken has broken marriage and family. A singular catastrophe. We call it sin. And as a result of sin, the family was cursed. In fact, the curse itself was issued in the very context of the family. Oh, just listen to it. Genesis chapter 3, verse 16. To the woman, God said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, and he shall rule over you. Did you notice that every component of the family was in that one verse in the statement of a curse? The family has fallen, beloved and friends. The family has fallen. The fundamental building block of society and the world has fallen. Let's remember that God gave the command to be fruitful and multiply to who? To the family. Be fruitful and multiply to the family. And now that family unit that multiplies across the earth suffers the affliction of sin the curse in the fall. So let us recognize with clarity what the family is and what she stands in need of, what she stands in greatest need of. Most families today do not live according to the intended purpose of God. Their only guide is nature And culture. And both are fallen. And often, culture is godless. The family is not itself an institution of redemption. That wasn't given to the family. But rather, the family stands in need of redemption. She's the building block of society. She was cursed. She is broken everywhere. And she stands in need of redemption. 
But here is the remarkable plan of God. If you're in Ephesians or with me, uh, keep your place, we'll come back. Let's go back to Genesis, all the way to the first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 12. And I want to just invite you into something most thrilling, to see the big picture, God's plan for families. I want you to see how this works out right here in Genesis chapter 12. Now, to understand this, Genesis chapter 1 to 11 is really a condensed history of the world to the point of the beginning of God's creation of the nation Israel. So you got the first 11 chapters is explaining the Toledot, the generations that preceded to basically set the stage for our understanding of what God is planning to do in history. So chapter 12 opens the scene with God's plan for the world. And how does he describe it? Look at it with me. Genesis 12, 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. By the way, that is a language that echoes marriage, that a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. And it's a picture of God sort of calling Abraham to a new marital connection, namely with him. But I must move on. Verse 2, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. Look at verse 3, I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the what? Tell me again. Families of the earth shall be blessed. This is the plan of God for families. From the beginning, he started with families, families Sin and fell. They are cursed. They are broken everywhere. And God's first statement about his plan is, I'm going to bless all the families through you. God creates a nation from one father. You see the picture? He calls Abram to be a father of many nations. You see, that's a picture of God fathering a new redeemed humanity. It's a massive aggregate of families, this nation that he's going to make. Its name was Israel. Israel was designed to be a model people, a nation among nations. Families that were restored to be in communion with the creator of heaven and earth. Israel was unique among all the peoples of the world. The reason their sign of the Shabbat, of the Sabbath, was to proclaim as a signature of the covenant that they are in covenant with the one God who made heaven and earth in six days and rested on the seventh. They were a unique people reconciled to God. But this was not all. This was not all. God didn't promise that I'm going to make you a nation where all the families in that nation will be blessed by me. No. He said more than that, didn't he? He promised that through Abraham's offspring, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So now go with me to Galatians. New Testament, Galatians, right before Ephesians. And look with me at chapter 3, Galatians 3, 16. Here's the issue. God's aim in calling Abraham, making a covenant with him and making promises, God's aim was nothing less than all the families of the earth. Now look with me, Galatians 3.16. Now the promises were made to who? To Abraham and to his offspring. And I love this exegete. This is a real biblical exegete, the Apostle Paul. He says, it does not say and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one. It's singular. And to your offspring. Who is, tell me, Christ. Christ. So the key is that the promise that God made to Abraham about 4,000 years ago, was a promise that he had Christ in mind as the very and exclusive means to bless families in the earth. 
The families of the earth needed much more than a model. They needed redemption. They needed more than a nation to show them how to live. They needed a savior. Every family of the earth. Look in Galatians at verse 29 now, chapter 3, verse 29. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring. He's speaking to me as a Gentile. He's speaking to you if you're a Gentile. He's saying if you are Jewish and you received the promise through Abraham, you, this continues, but that was given to you. If you're not Jewish, that wasn't given to you. But in Christ, by faith alone in Christ, you're a recipient. I love what he's saying. He's saying if you are Christ, in, if you're Christ then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to to promise. Heir, you're of Abraham, not of his flesh, but of faith. And so Ephesians, now look over with me. Uh, go one more book to your right. Ephesians chapter 3. And oh, this is so good. Verse 14. For this reason, Paul is extolling the glories of God and the gospel as he has revealed the triune God in chapter one. Remember this? He praises the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And after all of this, he exalts and he comes to this, this kind of culminating in at the end of chapter three over the gospel saying, for this reason, this is Ephesians 3.14, for this reason I bow my knees before the Father from whom every what? family in heaven and on earth is named. I don't think that's coincidental or just loose language or just meaningless variety of terms. This is something Paul has in mind, that there's something here that is so grand and so glorious that in Christ, the fulfillment of the promise to the families of the earth has come. God values the family and has not forsaken the family in his redemptive purposes. But only in Christ are families blessed to God. Only when the members of a natural family are made members of a supernatural God's family, then does that family experience true renewal. Look at chapter 4. This is Ephesians 4, verse 4. Let me just uh, accentuate something we should see. I'm saying, as we read this, I'm saying this is in fulfillment as Christ being the singular seed, as the singular door, as the only name under heaven by which any family, anyone in a family must be saved. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and tell me, Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. This speaks of the church. So here we have now the picture. The families need redemption, and the church holds it in her hands and has it in her heart. How do they relate? Let's not confuse the two. Let's make certain that we understand how they are to relate. The church is to be a steward of grace to families. To families. In other words, let's change our 21st century American mindset, which is all too way exaggerated on the individualistic mindset, and think in terms of families. God does. Let me close this first principle by asking a couple of pointed questions intending to cause us to think. Should we appreciate and promote healthy families among all people? Yes, a resounding yes. Let me, let me get under that. Is the family an exclusively Christian institution? No. The family was made before sin. The family is for all peoples of the world. 
every tribe, tongue, language, and nation, everybody. Family is for that. It's in the image of God, not in redemption. Family belongs to the image of God. Family belongs to created order. Should we promote that in the world? Yes, even if, even if the families are not, do not know God? Yes. Should that be our primary purpose as a church? Absolutely not. But we need to think about this, Christians. The family isn't a Christian institution. The family is a creation institution. It belongs to the image of God. So then we ask this, what do families need? Redemption. They need Christ. And who alone is so highly privileged and responsible to know and make known Christ, the church. Are you with me? Okay. Now, I don't say any of this condescending. If you, if you hear that, please know that's not my heart. I'm just, you know, well, never mind. Here's my issue. There is, this is all preliminary in understanding. It's preliminary in understanding the relationship between the family and the church. We have to know this before we can answer why do we do what we do and what should we be doing. So the second principle. The first principle is simple. The plan for the families is amazing. And the church has a very significant role in that. The second principle is the place of parents. Now, some parents passively assume that the spiritual education development and training of their children is the church's responsibility. That's not the case. It's not the case. By design, the family is the primary community for meaning and learning. The family, by design, yes, it functions in terms of order and economy, and there's, there's a proper placement of role and responsibility, but I want you to think deeper. The family is much more. It's much more than an expedient, like Darwinian evolution wants to try to ridiculously postulate. It's much more than an expedient. It's not very expedient. The family is a principal issue. It's driven by meaning and principle first, not feelings and if it works. So with that in mind, we need to think about what is the first primary function of a family, the first primary purpose of the family, the, the, the first place of the parents in the family is this, that the family is first the seminal, which means it's the, it's the very beginning, like the nursery, like the, where the seeds are placed. It's the seminal sphere where life is experienced, learned, and modeled, both good and bad, with godliness and ungodliness. God has determined that that first experience of life and reality happen in this nursery called the family. And it, as I've said before, it has, it has much to do with meaning, not just learning. It's not just what parents teach as much as it is where children find their meaning, where they find the essence of what is real. Why do they exist? What are they here for? The family should picture it and model it. And let's remember that babies are not born neutral. A baby doesn't become a sinner when it first sins. That's like saying... The guy in the foxhole with the enemy uniform became an enemy when he first shot at you. No. He's wearing the uniform. He's in the foxhole. The reason he shot is because he's an enemy. The reason children sin is because they're sinners. So let's remember that. They're not born neutral. They're born sinners. And why do I want to say this? I don't find delight in it. I have six precious children that I love to pieces. And I, 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 wish, I, I, wish, I wish I didn't have to deal with sin. But why I say that is because every parent needs to come to terms to understand. What's the family supposed to do in that context? Families are broken. 
child, a child will learn good or bad from you in the home. And a child must be taught by example and by word to worship the living God. They do not come from the womb ready to worship God on their own. They will not. They must be taught. They must be taught. And if the love of God is not their aim, I can assure you that the love of someone or something else will be. And we're not talking about redemption. We're talking about this, the principle of what they are made for, why they exist. They learn their meaning. A child should learn they are made to glorify God and enjoy him forever. A child should learn that the greatest commandment upon their soul is that they should love the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Where are they going to learn that? In principle and practice, but first in the home. Some might say, but, but my child is not born again. They're unregenerate. Well, yes, of course. That's, the, that's why I said that, to remind us that we are talking about teaching them things they cannot do. They cannot love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. But that's where the message that the church has comes in. We'll get to that in a moment. My point is, I'm not asking parents to treat their children like they're saints, like they're redeemed by the blood of Christ. I'm not asking them to do that, especially if they have not professed faith. No. I'm simply saying, think of the logic. Very basic. They're going to learn what to love and what their meaning is and what they should do with their lives from you. So do you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? then what could you possibly conceive of giving to your child as more important than that? You you see, it's not about treating them as redeemed. It's showing them this is a redeemed life. This is how it lives. Look to me. Every parent imparts meaning and purpose and identity and values. The question is the quality and the direction of them. But a redeemed parent centered on God cannot conceive of anything less than to impart Christ every day. Again, let's think about the story, the plan. God made a covenant with Israel calling her to walk in his ways, blessing their families and renewing them by his grace through faith. In other words, not everyone in Israel was Israel even. Not everyone was regenerate. And yet God still commanded all of them to honor the Lord, to obey his commands. And he called families to take up their part, starting starting with Father Abraham. So just mark this down in your notes. Genesis 18, verse 19. Listen carefully. Genesis 18, 19. God says, for I have chosen him, Abraham that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. One of the marks that Abraham has given is that he taught his children and his household. He taught them to keep the way of the Lord. And one of his sons Plainly did not. Ishmael became a rebel. But just before the nation of Israel, after they go down to Egypt and God redeems them and brings them out, and they go 40 years in the wilderness, and finally he brings them up on the plains of Moab. They're staring over the Jordan. They're looking into the promised land, and here they are. And now we have this word from Deuteronomy. Moses, before he dies, he declares and gives his final treatise to the nation. And he says this in Deuteronomy 4, 9. Only take care and keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen. They are eyewitnesses. And lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. Now listen. Make them known to your children and to your children's children. 
God is passionate right at the beginning. Before they get to go into the promised land, he says, don't go in. Don't go in until you understand the high responsibility you have to make these things known to your children. In Deuteronomy, if you'd like to look there with me, go to Deuteronomy chapter 6. And look at verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Deuteronomy 6, 6. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart, parent. And verse 7. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as, sign, as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontals between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And the point is so incredibly emphatic in every aspect of who you really are when no one else sees you, when you have no company, when you're in your pajamas, the who you are is what the children will see and learn from. And that who you are must be one who loves the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And you are marked on your hands and marked on your eyes and marked on your mind and marked in your dwelling. Everything is marked by the presence and for the glory of God. This happens in the family. In verse 20, he says, when your sons ask you in time to come, and I can give you so many examples where he says this over and over, when they ask you, when they ask you, in Exodus chapter 10, they do the same thing, that you may tell in the hearing of your sons and your grandsons when they ask you. In chapter 12, 26, when your children say to you, 13, 8, you shall tell your sons on that day when they ask. In 13, 14, when in time to come, your sons ask you, and on and on. Jump over to chapter 11, Deuteronomy 11. 19, you shall teach them to your children, talk of them when you are sitting in your house and when you are walking by the way and when you lie down, when you rise. Look at 32, 46. I'm going fast. It's okay. It's all right. Deuteronomy 32, 46, take to heart all the words by which I am warning you today that you may command them to what? Your children. And now join me, please, in Joshua, the book of Joshua. Look at chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 6. There in the middle, he says, when your children ask in time to come, and he's describing the monument they set up about how God led them into the promised land. And now lastly, in Joshua, go over to chapter 24, the end of the book. Joshua 24, verse 15. And at the very end of that verse, Joshua began his statement by saying, when your children ask, make sure you teach them. And then he ends by saying, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The resolve comes from the head of the household, the father. And the word to serve is often translated worship. As for me and my house will be dedicated and devoted to Yahweh. You need to choose who you will be devoted to, families. That was his charge. Now, this is the most stunning thing I want you to see, and then we'll kind of wrap this point up. Go to Judges, the next book over, and you're going to see something absolutely remarkable. Judges chapter 2, look at verse 7. This is, I want this to be stunning in our thoughts about how significant it is for you, for every generation to teach your children. Because Joshua said, after Moses, Joshua was a child when Moses started. And Moses is saying, you got to teach this, you got to teach this, you got to teach this. Joshua heard, got it. When he became a man and a father of a house, he taught it. He taught it. And then he said, I'm going to lead my household. We're going to follow and we're going to worship Yahweh. And then Joshua dies. And look at what happens in Judges chapter 2, verse 7. And the people served 
Yahweh. They served the Lord all the days of Joshua. Now look at verse 10. And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers, and there arose another generation after them who did not what? Know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. Amazing! Joshua walked through the Red Sea, and the next generation didn't even know that they went through the Red Sea? How does that happen? When parents take for granted that they're in the camp, they're among the people of God, they've been blessed, and they go off pursuing glitter and neglect to tell their children. How can this happen? Another generation, one generation away rises and they don't know what God has done for Israel? Verse 11, and the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served Baals. Verse 12, and they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers. This should disturb us. They abandoned God. This shows how vital it is for every family in every generation to teach their children. Let me just be extremely clear. Don't rely on anyone else. The church, a Sunday school teacher, a youth group, or anything else. It's your responsibility. In fact, look with me at Psalm 78. Psalm 78, verse 5. He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach their children. And verse 6, Psalm 78, 6, that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children, so that they should set their hope in God, like we sang about. And not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. And that they should not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast, whose spirit was not faithful to God. So I'm calling to all the fathers in this room who do not come from faithful homes for you to rise up and not be like, even if your father was a loving man, I praise God for that, even if so. You are responsible to teach your children the truths of God. You are called like this to teach them, even if your father was not faithful to do it. In Joel 1, 3, tell your children of it and let your children tell their children and their children tell another generation. It is through the family that the propagation of the truth of God is to be seminally dismissed or dis dis disseminated and dispersed. Isaiah 38, 19, the living, the living, he thanks you as I do this day. The father makes known to the children your faithfulness. Parents, this is not a call for you to teach your children because that you are doing. You are teaching them. This is a call to teach them the way of the living God. Because there are bad examples, like 1 Kings 15, 3. Abijam walked in all the sins that his father did before him. Jeremiah 9, 14. Stubbornly followed their, their own hearts and have gone after Baals as their fathers taught them. Hmm. So I am only trying to be faithful to the text of God, which is unavoidable to notice that fathers have a particular responsibility. Is that just me, or did you hear that too? It is hard to overstate the importance of the family, beloved and friends, and especially the role of the father. Our current culture will mock and scorn at that statement and treat you like you're antiquated. This is a patriarchal, deprecated system. Well, 
Let me be like Joshua. You choose this day, fathers, who you will serve and how you will lead your families. Will you follow the voice of Christ or culture? David Michael says this in his great book, Zealous. The influence that a husband and father has on the strength of a marriage, the stability of the home, and the physical, emotional, and spiritual development of children is incalculable. The investment that a church makes helping men understand their role and responsibility as shepherds of their home and giving them the tools and support they need can bear fruit in the lives of their children and grandchildren for generations. That is my burden. And that's why I'm speaking to you today. This is my conviction. Fathers, we need to rise up. And the responsibility needs to be clearly and squarely restored right there in the home. Would you, let's finish this point by going to Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now, something I want to point out very brief. A lot of what we just looked at was all Old Covenant. And Christ has fulfilled the Old Covenant. But let's remember, that's about the religious institution. And so that would be on par with the church is different than Israel. But the family is not, is not that redemptive institution. So the family in the Old Covenant doesn't change in the new covenant. There is no command in the new covenant that says anything about the family being changed. No, no, because the family belongs to the creation order. The family belongs to the image of God, not to redemption. So the family remains. So what that means is it makes perfect sense why the apostle Paul will actually quote the Decalogue, quote the Torah, and speak of the old covenant as a binding principle for families in the new covenant when dealing with the family. Make sense? Are you guys with me? So the family didn't change in terms of how the people of God are to minister to the families of the earth. So with that in mind, I want to show you that this is totally countercultural, not only today, but back then. Oh, this is totally counter. Don't, don't think, oh, it's too hard for us today. I mean, <laughs> you don't know how hard. It- Believe me, I know how hard it is. But it's countercultural even back then. Let me just show you this. You know, in the Roman world, there was what is called the patria protasis, which is the, uh, the idea of the father has total power. He has unlimited wielding of authority over his children, even to the point of life and death. A father can just, on a whim, take the life of a child. There are plenty of examples of letters written in the Roman era at the time of Christ where a father who's away at battle would write back to a pregnant wife and say, if it's a boy, keep it. If it's a girl, kill it. No questions. It's thrown in there just among the, I love you and I miss you and I'll see you when I get back. Just thrown in there. Oh, by the way, if it's a girl, kill it. That's the kind of power fathers had. And it wasn't winked at. So... This is profoundly countercultural. Why? Because Paul says, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. What? Wait a second. Time out. Everywhere, this is found nowhere else in the ancient world. Everywhere else in what they call the the tables for families, the laws, the codes, the cultural customs and mores, everywhere the Greeks and Romans said, children, do not provoke your father to anger because it could mean death. Here, Paul reverses it. And he shows, a, he shows a redeemed father. He says, here's the agent of change in the family. The father must be of a redeemed character and heart. And he must, and the second reason and evidence that it's countercultural is very simple, and that is that in all the household tables in the ancient world, Any mention about families like this, because they had these kinds of passages, (laughs) it was always, well, the powers at the father's disposal that are listed. 
In fact, there are often, and I have many of them, I didn't have the time to read them to you, but I have many examples where there's things written about how you need to beat them often, you need to do this, you need to do that, you need to do this. And it's all about how much power you have to dispose of upon them. And here he flips it again. And instead of giving fathers any statement about their authority and power over their children, the only thing Paul has to say is their duty. Not what their children owe them, but what they owe their children. Their duty. Make sure, make certain that you raise them up and teach them the instruction and the discipline of the Lord. That's your responsibility, fathers. Totally countercultural in that world. The child owes me. They shouldn't make me mad. No, let's flip it. You be like Christ. Bring them up. Ectrofo means um, to nourish. In fact, you know what? It's found right there in chapter 5, verse 29. Look at it. Look at it. Right? Just, just move your eyes a little bit up on the page for most of you. For no one ha- hated, ever hated his own flesh, but there's our word, nourishes. Nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church. So just as Christ does the church, so fathers, you need to do the children. You need to, you need to nourish them. It means to feed them, to provide for them, to to care for them, to invest in them, to spoon feed if necessary, to to cherish them, to, to lovingly, tenderly see their growth, see to it. And the discipline, paideia, training, instruction, even correction at times, it means to enculturate, it means to develop Cause the vine to go around, to turn this way, to turn that way. That's what Proverbs 22, 6 is about. Train train up a child in the way he should go and he should not depart from it. Like a vine, when you train it to go around, it it will harden and stay there. That's that's the idea here, to to paideia, to to train them. It's where you get the word pedagogue, just to teach and hold their hand and show them the way. And instruction. Nothesia. Nuthateo comes from this. It's the idea of the mind. It's the way you think. This is an appeal to their reason and their judgments and values. It's to get into their hearts and their thinking and the way they perceive and how they discern what is right and wrong and true and false. Fathers, speak into these precious lives and help them to develop an understanding by nourishing them in this way. And notice, it's not simply to teach them or to cause a certain form of behavior conformity or to call them to obedience to a father. It's to teach them and to draw them not to the father, but to the Lord. All of it, the nourishing, the instructing, the discipline is all of the Lord. It's all pointing to Christ. It's all for Christ. Chapter 4, verse 20, is Paul even said, that's not the way you learned Christ. He uses that same word. The fathers didn't learn Christ this way, so now you need to take that model and teach it to your children to learn Christ. Learn Christ. Oh, there's so much, so much more I'd like to say. I, I must move on for application. One, one quote from a Puritan, William Gouge says this, Many parents labor, toil, and worry too much about amassing wealth and a worldly status for their children, neglecting their true and eternal need. Parents, you are unique stewards, all of you, and mothers are not excluded here. It's just that fathers are given the primary responsibility. Let me give you an example. In 1 Thessalonians 2.7, Paul, he related himself to the picture of the family, and he says, We were gentle among you like nursing mothers, taking care of her own children. That's how a mother should. Or 1 Thessalonians 2.11, Paul says, For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you, we encouraged you, and we charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his glory and kingdom. You hear that? Exhorted, encouraged, and charged. These are the kinds of things that mother and father should be doing because your stewardship is unique, profoundly unique. And you have a particular and a unique interest and affection and accountability and responsibility for your own children, all of you. You know them better than anyone else. You have more time with them. You should. 
more than others, especially when they're young. You have more access into their hearts than any other adult. Why would we think of someone else doing these things? And remember, in 2 Timothy 1.5, Paul commends Grandmother Lois and Mother Eunice for how those two moms, or grandma and mom, how they, even without a faithful father in the home, took their little son, Titus, or Timothy, excuse me, took Timothy and taught him the scriptures. Because then later in chapter 3, verse 14, as for you, continue in what you've learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it. It brings weight and credence. And how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ. You notice that? The parent didn't save the child by teaching them, but they gave them what is able to save them. They taught them the word of God. And Paul is now celebrating that. Let me give one word of encouragement to help, uh, just to help minister to all you parents Parenting is a stewardship, and its success is measured not by what your children do, but by what you do. Proverbs 22.6 is not a promise. If you train them up this way, they, they will not depart. It's not a promise any more than the two verses earlier. The reward of humility and fear of the Lord is riches and honor. Uh, everywhere else in Scripture, like Psalm 73 says the opposite. Why do the wicked prosper? It's not a promise. It's a proverb. So parents, please know that you're called to be stewards, to be faithful. It's based upon your, your faithfulness, not your children's outcome. Remember that your home, your family is a mission field. If any of us truly obey the Great Commission that we are to go out and make disciples of nations, how great the hypocrisy then if we would just neglect those in our own home? How could we write checks for missionaries and not teach our children? How could we come to church and teach other children and not our own? It all begins at home. And it is, again, a stewardship. So on the one hand, parents can carry the weight of thinking that, well, they are to blame for every weakness and failing of their children. No, because salvation is by grace alone, not by good parenting. And on the other hand, parents can try to excuse and convince themselves and others that they are in no way to blame. Someone else or something else did it. It was the culture, it was this, it was the failure of the church. Let us avoid both of these errors. The stewardship falls to you, parents. Let us labor then as though the salvation of our children did depend on us. As though. Let us labor as though it did. And let us rest knowing that it doesn't that it relies entirely upon the grace of God and their own personal accountability before him. J.C. Ryle says, Beware of that miserable delusion into which some have fallen, that parents can do nothing for their children, that you must leave them alone, wait for grace, and sit still. The devil rejoices to see such reasoning, just as he always does over anything which seems to excuse indolence or to encourage neglect of means. So I ask you very simple, and I'm going to move on to application more, uh, is this, simply this. Um, how, How then, hearing what you have heard, hearing the command after command after command after command, how then can you, anyone, can we justify a family choosing a church based upon its youth ministry? How? It's The church is never commanded to teach your children. You are. So how can we have this happening? Not not that we're having a crisis here, but we're not immune. People think thoughts. 
Parents, not the church, are accountable to God for the physical, the spiritual, the emotional, the intellectual well-being of their children. Parents, not the church. The church has also no authority to discipline your children. That's you. They go hand in hand. So, with that, I want to give you a Chinese proverb. One generation plants trees, and the next gets shade. Fathers, are you planting the trees for your children? Because God says that he will visit the iniquity of the fathers onto the children, to the second and third generation. Meaning that what you plant will affect them. You will predispose them. Or you will predispose them to be in a context of mercy, to hear the gospel, to be not isolated, but to be protected from all unnecessary filth. Family, parents, plant the trees. I, 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 I need to conclude. I know. <laughs> Thank you for your patience. This is a hugely important subject for us. I want to give you one quote, and then I'm going to wrap it up. Edwards, Jonathan Edwards, I just can't help but to share with you the wisdom of this man. The day that he gave his last sermon, this is what he said. In his very last sermon, his final words, of all the things he could have emphasized, This is number one on his list of application. Number one. I quote, I conclude with a few words of advice to all in general, in some particulars which are of great importance in order to the future welfare and prosperity of the church and congregation. Number one, one thing that greatly concerns you as you would be a happy people is the maintaining of your families. Let me now, therefore, once more, before I finally cease to speak to this congregation, repeat and earnestly press the counsel which I have often urged on heads of families while I was their pastor, to great painfulness in teaching, warning, and directing their children, bringing them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, beginning early where there is yet opportunity and maintaining a constant diligence in labors of this kind. Considered by many to be the greatest theologian America has ever had. His last sermon, he said, this is the one thing, number one, I want to leave you. What's so vital for the church in the 1700s is even more today. They didn't even have youth groups back then. They didn't even have Sunday school back then. And this was the charge. Well, what is the place of the church in comparison? That's my third. And uh, let me, I'm, I'm going to just wrap this up. Very, very brief. I think I've given enough intensity on the place of the parents. I do want, though, to contrast because some parents assume that the family is spiritually autonomous and that de- that the family is determinative in the church as though the church centered on the family some speak of the the family being so central to God's purposes and plans in redemption that well I could take or leave the church and you have home church movements And you have a low view of the church. And you have a confusion of the role of the church and the place of the church. I mean, I quote to you, some actually say, the church is simply an extension of the family. No, it's not. I quote to you, families need the church family. And the church needs godly family units. These two institutions are God's means of spreading his kingdom in the world. Where did you get that? Where does God ever tell the family, go proclaim the gospel? Where did you get that? You didn't. Scripture never says that. That belongs to creation. The gospel belongs to the church. So follow me. 
Call them family churches, call them house churches, call them anything you like. But the family church combination could be the basis of thorough renewal and revival. Hmm. Not if you confuse the role and responsibility of each. So this, listen, the family is never called the pillar and buttress of the truth. That's the church. The family does not have Holy Spirit appointed leaders who are accountable to the congregation. That's the church, not the family. The, f- the church administers the ordinances, not the family. 1 Corinthians 11, 18 to 22, very plainly, Paul says, look, what are you doing when you gather? And he says, as a church, I hear that you're actually having disputes, some of you eating more than others. He says, don't you have homes for that? Go to your family and do that. Don't come to the church of God and do that. Don't despise the church of God. His point is the ordinance belongs to the church, not the family. You need to respect the difference of boundaries between family and church. The church is the one equipped and given. Ephesians 4.11, he gives to the church apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherd, teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, to the building up of the body of Christ. The family is not the body of Christ, the church is. The family is not the bride of Christ, the church is. Christ died for the church, not the family. What's the place of the church? The church is precious. She is unique. She holds the gospel and the only cure to families. So the family needs the church. The church doesn't need the family. Is it good to have healthy families in the church? Absolutely. But we skew and contort and distort the truth that the church is the family of God. I'm out of time, so I'm going to summarize. When Jesus Christ, Matthew 12, was preaching to a group of people, his mother, by biological, and his brothers and sisters come to the outside of the room. And they say, hey, Jesus, your mother and your brothers and sisters are here. You know what Jesus does? He stops, he looks over, and he says, who are my mother and brother and sisters? Ouch. You know what he was doing? He was drawing a distinction between the confusion of family and the redemptive community. And then he answers this way. These are my mother and brother and sisters, those who do the will of my father. Because the father is the father of the church, and we are all brothers and sisters in it. It is his household, his family. Let's not confuse the two. Or how about this one? Luke chapter 14, verse 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, cannot be my disciple. What does that show? But that, that the community of the redeemed might actually break up the family. Not by intention, not by design, but because of the rebellious hard heartedness of people in families. We have to see that the family belongs to the created order. The church belongs to the redeemed order. And the church is a steward to the family. Does that make sense? So I close right here. Oh, I had so much more. Those who want to hear a second sermon. No, I'm joking. Um, Number four, and I'll close. I promise, I promise, I promise with this. And that is the provision. This is what I want to do. I want to say, then what do we do? Because this wasn't to call parents uh, to do all the work without the support of the church. If I say the church is, is the steward of grace to the families, then I want us to see, I, I'm praying and the shepherds are talking and we're working out and we're laboring to see what we can do to step to glorify God in this. How we can offer more equipping to all you families. How we can be more actively engaged in helping parents and giving them materials and actually walking alongside, getting into groups and teaching and helping to help fathers and mothers teach their children and walk with them and show them the Lord. To do more activities together among the the ages. So with all of that, I'm super excited, and I want to give you a few resolves, things that we want to do. We want to promote biblically qualified leadership. That's the first step in the church to have the proper order in the church. Secondly, promote corporate worship, where all the children are present during the corporate worship. We do that. Third, promote a biblical view of marriage and family. Fourth, promote biblical parenthood, which includes encouraging and equipping parents to teach at home and and to be involved in the teaching at the church, where there are children, of course. And number five, 
promote equipping of the parents. Number six, promote Christian education. And number seven, promote Christ. Everything else we promote is to promote Christ for God's glory and man's joy. And this includes families. The family is not the center of the church. Christ is. I'm privileged to be able to be with you in this and labor together with you. So look, parents, for what is to come about new ministry opportunities to help equip you, to support you, and encourage you as we together, the church, tries to steward grace to the family. Father, thank you for the privilege to be here. Thank you for the grace you've shown even in in this message. I ask your mercy, Lord, upon each one who is here, that you would comfort and strengthen parents who have a heavy heart, um, who may be burdened over the challenges of parenting, feeling that it's impossible or they can't see any way that they could do what they've heard. I pray for them. And I pray, Father, also that you would comfort every parent here who might have regrets or who might be struggling in thoughts of what they could have done better or, uh, or just simply struggling over, over a wayward child or um, just the cir- current circumstances of their home and marriage. Oh, Father, I pray you bring comfort. Remind us all of grace and help the church to not be an institution of law but of grace. Help us to come alongside and to love and encourage. Help them to hear that I love them and that this effort was to call a clear distinction between confusing areas. May there be clarity in our hearts and minds. May we be recalibrated and may we be strengthened with greater energy to honor the Lord our God. It is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.